I mean, one in eight people, everyone in this chat, whether they know it right now or not, there is someone in their orbit that is struggling, will struggle uh, with infertility or miscarriage. Dr. Kenan Omertag, hello. In the building. No. How you doing, my friend? <laughs> What's up, Ryan? How are you? <laughs> we need we needed some like music to get you like your your at bat music um, hey, to get you going. Sh- yeah, totally. Shout out to the medical students who do the walk up mm. uh, songs when they go. So at WashU, they read they would read their like you know where I match, but they would do walk up music, and I always <laughs> knew like the music would come on and it would be like Gucci Mane, Usher, <laughs> and I was like they're from Georgia. They went to Emory. <laughs> I mean, I went. I did residency at Emory, so I yeah. was like, "Yep," and and I was right. They're from Atlanta, there you go. The Gucci Mane. All right, all right. Let's do that again, Doctor Kenan Omertag. <laughs> all right, got the yeah, got yeah, the yeah. sound effects going too. That's right. All right, we are going to talk about uh, a fun little subspecialty within the OBGYN world: reproductive right. endocrinology and infertility. Now, a very common question. Let's get the awkward question out of the way. A very common question from pre-meds is like, how does a dude oh, yeah. get involved in OBGYN? Why would you choose that as a specialty? And I will preface that, I'll put an asterisk on it, that I was about this close away from going into OB over ortho, which is the only reason I went to medical school. But you ended up doing ER, right? I, I went the flight surgeon route because of the Air Force. So I'm a okay. GP flight surgeon, or I was for a while. Okay. So a lot of the special, first of all, there's the reason I went into it had to do with a couple of things. First, you're always at the center of the discussion because reproductive health, there's always, there's never a dull moment, right? There's always something to talk about, whether it's politically, whether it's uh, who doesn't like talking about sex. I mean, there's people, you know, people always love to talk about that. Um, so I wanted to have a job that I thought would be fun to talk about, actually. Um, I also wanted something that I thought you could actually see the fruits of your labor. Um, like, hey, it's because of, you know, the service I provided that, you know, this couple is able to have this child. And if it wasn't for me, they wouldn't be able to. Um, maybe there's some egotism, egotism, walk, egotism about it, but walk up I to mean, a five-year-old and be like, you're welcome. <laughs> right. I also, there was a joke. Uh, I remember, um, not really a joke, but I mean, th- those were the kind of things that, uh, were attractive from a medical standpoint. And then the policy, I was always fascinated by policy and how physicians don't really do much with policy. And this is in the, like, I'm 39. So this, this would have been late nineties. So I was interested in reproductive policy and, you know, the conversations we have around abortion and contraception are the same conversations we were having 20 years ago. Um, So a lot of those conversations kind of enlightened me a little bit, or at least emboldened me to pursue the specialty, because I also thought that would be a unique way for me to stand out as a candidate because of my interest in policy, because most people were doing basic science. Most people were interested in, um, you know, the, the, the kind of stereotypical things that people would be interested in going into a specialty. And I was like, no, nah, I'm going to do policy and I'm going to focus on policy as it relates to IVF. Oh, it's not really covered. Well, why is that? Um, what are the barriers? Uh, so I thought that would be fascinating. I mean, I kind of choose, chose this specialty from a, 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 from a very young age, quite frankly. Um, and we could talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So those are the three things. Yeah. And the, other, oh, and the other thing was the intimate relationship with the patient. Yeah. So in my personal statement that I wrote, it was it was the fascinating science. You're always on the frontier of science. It's the ethics that goes with it. You're you know, it's the intimate relationship with the patient, because quite frankly, um, the reproductive journey is a very intimate one. And it's a pretty special one. I mean, it takes a certain type of person, I think, to be able to project the amount of empathy throughout a fertility journey, which can last months to years um, and it can be emotionally exhausting uh, and then the policy piece yeah do we have any data on the prevalence of infertility issues is it increasing decreasing 
Are we seeing, I, I know we had a, a thyroid specialist on recently and, and she talked about just so many hormone disruptors and clothes these days and the, the stuff around us. Are we seeing any issues with that? There are reports. So the question is, that, so yes, I think we're seeing, you know, you, there are sperm counts are dropping. Is the, what is, is that the plasticizers? I mean, they're even going so far as to say it's making comments about penis size, which I think is getting a little too sensational. But <laughs> I mean, the sperm thing, the sperm thing has been, you know, there are plasticizers, there's environmental toxins that are causing sperm counts to decline. But, you know, sperm counts declining is one thing is fertility also declining. Um, and that's a harder and that's a harder question to answer because it takes a sperm and an egg to address fertility. And we know on the egg side of things, we know that there's a greater delay to childbearing. And that's been something that's yeah. been at play for 35, 40 years. So this isn't really new. Um, so I think there is something to be said about declining fertility. Yeah. Um, but there's also something, I mean, one in eight, everyone in this chat, whether they know it right now or not, there is someone in their orbit that is struggling, will struggle uh, with infertility or miscarriage. Mm. So today, this month is uh, at the end of April is National Infertility Awareness Week. Um, and one of the big stats is one in eight reproductive age couples will struggle with infertility. And one in four will experience miscarriage. And we don't talk about that enough. So you wouldn't know that. I mean, you know, you go to high school, they, th they say, ah, you have unprotected intercourse one time, there's a 100% chance you're going to have a baby. And that's not true. But that's the, the, the maximum efficiency of human reproduction is at best 20%. But yeah. the contract we've decided to, you know, have with, uh, with the West here in the United States is that, yeah, we're going to pretend we're going to protect unintended pregnancy by talking about this, you know, maximum efficiency of human reproduction being 100%. It's just not true. But that's yeah. the message we go with. However, if you keep having unprotected intercourse, uh, you know, after six months, 75% of people will concede. Yeah. Um, do you think the advent of social media, right? There's lots of negatives with social media, tons of positives. We have yeah. people like Chrissy Teigen come out, Meghan Markle come out, talk about miscarriage. Do you think that's making that dialogue better that, that people are talking about it? 100%. Yeah. Because it's mainstreaming it. Yeah. And um, it's bringing it to the eyes of the public. Very cool. And and one of the things we love to talk about here is bread and butter. What's bread and butter for your field? I heard you, yeah, I heard you talking about this before. <laughs> so bread and butter um, for our specialty is the infertility piece. Now it's reproductive endocrinology and infertility, but it's not really about infertility anymore. Over the past decade, the scope has expanded. But I think the bread and butter is the patient with you know irregular periods, polycystic ovarian syndrome who just needs some medication to help them ovulate regularly to achieve pregnancy. So I would call that the bread and butter. Mm -hmm. um, it's probably expanding now to IVF being the bread and butter. Um, and there are comp and then complexities within IVF uh, treatment plans. Yeah. Well, awesome. I, I know you uh, want to get to the whiteboard and scribble and draw and do some cases and stuff. So why don't we go to that if you're ready to? Yeah, let's do it. And for those like of you, it. if you're seeing freezing and stuff, just just reconnect as you need to, and uh, we'll get going. Yeah, I see some stuff in the chat. I'll try to get to that as I can. So I think the first thing, and I always like to do this. Um, so let's go. I always like to draw. So I do this every day with patients. So this is the life of a reproductive endocrinologist um, is drawing. <laughs> um, because a lot of what we do, so reproductive endocrinologists are the maestros of the menstrual cycle. The menstrual, <laughs> menstrual, the menstrual cycle is um, a uh, vital sign. So if you think otherwise, I would disagree with you. It is a vital sign. And it is very important, regardless of what specialty you go in, to understand how it works. Because, and that's why I say reproductive endocrinology is at the center of everything, because everyone, you know, people have periods. You need to understand how periods work if you want to have if you want to uh, have a child, if you want to avoid pregnancy, if you want to have a better quality of life, um, if you want to manipulate the cycle. It's very important to understand how periods work. And I don't think we do a good job talking about that in, you know, 
growing up. And I think we should do a better job. So I'd like to think we're making up for some lost time in these, in this 40 minutes we're here. So, so, not- so maestro of the menstrual cycle, what about playwright of the period? Oh, that, that hashtag, that playwright <laughs> of the period, maestro of the menstrual cycle. I'll, I'll, I'll keep coming up with tra- some more. Tra- trademark that one. <laughs> um, you heard it here first. guys. Um, so Let's talk about it. So again, you guys have heard this before, but it's really important. I'm going to break it down for you. It's very important to understand how the menstrual cycle works. At the beginning of a menstrual cycle, your cycle day number one, you know, you have this hormone called FSH that communicates with the ovary. And, you know, women are born with a fixed number of eggs um, and that number declines so that over the course of the reproductive lifespan, 400 eggs are released. Normally what happens is the brain at the beginning of a cycle will recruit FSH, uh, will use FSH to recruit follicles, but only, you know, one, you'll have this large cohort of follicles, but ultimately only one will dominate. And that one that dominates starts to make a lot of estrogen. That estrogen feeds back to the brain, says, hey, you don't need to send this signal anymore. Send me the other signal so I can ovulate. And the LH signal comes in. Um, and then 36 to 48 hours after this level peaks, the egg is released and you have ovulation. The structure that's left over, I'll draw on this side for the sake of illustration, is called a corpus luteum. It makes progesterone, progestation, um, hormone discovered at WashU here in St. Louis. Um, So basically what ends up happening is the corpus luteum makes progesterone for two weeks. If you don't fertilize the egg and implant, so the egg is released, if no, and it fertilized, and then it implants, if no implantation occurs, the crosstalk between the corpus luteum and the embryo is no longer. The corpus luteum stops making a uh, progesterone and the withdrawal of the progesterone causes a period and the whole thing starts over again. So if you can understand how this works, you can understand how we time sperm exposure to achieve the fertile window. Um, you can understand how we use contraception to, uh, to prevent ovulation. It all comes back to this. So what I'll go to, what I want to show you now is, again, this is the stylized menstrual cycle. Here's cycle day number one. Now, we assume that everyone, when we teach the menstrual cycle, we assume everyone has 28-day periods, and that's not true. That's probably about 20 to 30% of the population, and that's a Scandinavian population of note. Um, (laughs) Most people have, you know, periods that are somewhere between 24 and 35 days, right? Some people, the periods are... 27 to 29. Some people, they're more than 35. Some people, they're less than 24. We call, cycle intervals are counted with cycle day one being the first day of full flow. Okay. So the first day of full flow is cycle day one. Um, at the beginning of the cycle, you know, that is called the follicular phase. From the beginning of the cycle to ovulation is called the follicular phase. From ovulation to the start of the next cycle is called the luteal phase. Okay. The follicular phase is an estrogen dominant phase. The luteal phase is a progesterone dominant phase. The luteal phase is fixed. The follicular phase is variable. So patients who have yeah, I had a 29 day cycle and then I had a 35 day cycle and then I had a 40 day cycle and then I had a 36. It's because their follicular phase is, the length of it is variable. It might be longer, shorter. The follicular, the luteal phase is fixed. It's usually 12 to 14 days. Okay. So this is the conversation I have with patients. I don't get this granular with patients. Um, I do have this conversation with patients all the time and I explain kind of how periods work. The other thing they'll ask is how do I know I'm ovulating? Well, how do you know you're ovulating? How does someone know you're ovulating? You are ovulating if you have a period and you are not pregnant. So think about that. You are, uh, how, if, why does someone have a period? I'm, I'm sure you guys were all ready to have this conversation tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk why, about it. Yeah. Why does somebody have a period? Some, people have a period because, now again, assuming they're not on birth control pills or any kind of hormones, you have a period because you um, made progesterone and you withdrew that progesterone. 
Mm. So how did you make the progesterone? Well, I made the progesterone because I made a corpus luteum that made progesterone. Well, how did you make a corpus luteum? Well, because I ovulated. Okay. And well, what do you mean if I'm not pregnant? Well, if you're not pregnant, you're not going to salvage the corpus luteum. The ACG hormone is what allows the corpus luteum to continue to make progesterone so that the pregnancy can grow to about eight to 10 weeks, at which point the placenta takes over progesterone production. Okay. So I get this question all the time where patients will say, Hey, I, I don't know if I'm, ha if I'm ovulating and I'm like, Oh, okay. What's up? Are you having periods? Yes. Like every 28 days, then I'll say, you know, Hey, this is, let me explain how this works. You're definitely ovulating. You know, why, why do you, what about, you know, what I just told you doesn't make sense. And then we go into the conversation. So I love having these conversations with patients because I, it's just a great opportunity to educate. Um, and the way we do it now over zoom, cause all my visits are telehealth visits uh, over the last, just before COVID actually, we kind of were moving in that direction. Then COVID allowed us to do, to scale the entire practice that way. Um, it's just a great opportunity to educate. And I have one hour with every patient. So um, I kind of want to get into some of these questions. Is that cool? Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, because I'm seeing a lot. So usually when I give these lectures, so I give this lecture to the medical students at WashU. Yeah. Um, so I get some of these questions are, um, let's see, can low progesterone levels affect ovulation? So low progesterone level. So you can't make progesterone until you ovulate. Mm. So after ovulation, you will make progesterone. Now, remember what causes you to ovulate? It's that LH surge that causes you to ovulate. So what is the key ingredient in birth control pills? The key ingredient in birth control, in birth control pills, combined oral contraceptive pills, there's an estrogen and there's a progestin. The key ingredient that prevents ovulation is the progestin because progestin prevents the LH surge. So if I can prevent the LH surge, I will prevent ovulation. So that's how birth control pills work. So if I gave someone a high dose of a progestin before I thought they were going to ovulate, I will prevent them from getting, I will prevent them from ovulating. So generically, I, I've heard oral contraceptive pills be described as as pretending that you're pregnant, telling your body that you're already pregnant. Is that, mm. is that too general? Is that false? Um, it, well, okay. It's, it's true, but let's get, let's unpack that. The predominant hormone in pregnancy is progesterone. Okay. It causes the hormone that causes the mood. It causes the um, breast tenderness. Um, so if you're making a ton of progesterone in pregnancy, you're going to have those symptoms. The key ingredient in the birth control pills is the progestin that's in it. it those are synthetic derivatives of the 21 carbon structure progesterone. They're not all 21 carbon structures. That's some endocrine grammar for everybody. Um, birth control pills have progestins in them, which are like 18 and 19 carbon structures, not 21. Nerding out for everybody who, who's down with it. That's why this is a great field. Shout out to people who love biochemistry. Uh, <laughs> Nerds. <laughs> nerd. Uh, that's me. Uh, right there with you guys. Um, but it's, the, pro it's um, the progestin that's in the birth control pills can cause some of that breast tenderness, can cause some of those mood symptoms. So that's why people say that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so a period can't happen if one doesn't ovulate. Yes, Priya, that is correct. You are having periods if you ovulated and did not get pregnant. Um, shedding of the endometrial layer of the uterus caused by decreased levels of progesterone due to the death of mature. Okay. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Can you in depth about secondary infertility? Uh, secondary infertility is basically, we'll talk, we can talk a little bit about that, but secondary infertility is basically uh, you had a live birth before with no problem, but then it's taking you 12 months um, or more to have uh, to get pregnant with the second child. Um, why is the follicular phase variable? Um, because, great question. So FSH recruits a, co a dominant follicle from a cohort um, here in the ovary. And sometimes it takes 10 days to recruit that dominant follicle. Sometimes it takes 
15 days. In someone with PCOS, for example, who never ovulates, they are chronically suspended in the follicular phase because they never ovulate. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I'll, mo I'll monitor the chat. Uh, if you guys have questions, let me know, throw them out here. So uh, real quick, let me say a couple things about this and then I wanna talk about some cases in infertility. Um, the best time to have sperm exposure to maximize your chances of pregnancy would be when you ovulate. So sperm lives in the genital tract for up to five days. So if I'm gonna, if I know I'm ovulating on Wednesday, and my sperm source is not is is leaving town on Monday, I want to make sure I have sperm exposure Monday morning before my sperm source I, leaves. I I just I want to pause right there. I yeah. I feel attacked and belittled by you considering me a sperm source. I am a human <laughs> being. <laughs> <laughs> that. that so shout out to Ryan because he's, he's raising a point, but the, you'll notice the language that I use. There's a reason why I use the language because in reproductive, you know, in my specialty, I will see patients who may not, you know, identify as male, but have my identify as female and have sperm bearing tissues. Yep. So I've, I've come to adopt the term sperm source as kind of like this inclusive term uh, to account for all these variations. Yep. But you're right. Um, you are a human being and you do have travel that takes you out of town on Monday <laughs> and we got to get, so what I would tell the patient there is I would say, Hey, you need to get sperm. You, you guys need to have intercourse before Ryan leaves, because if you think you're going to ovulate on Wednesday, you want to get intercourse. You want to have sperm exposure so that there's sperm there waiting in the tube so that when that egg is released, the sperm is there. So how long did it take you not to giggle every time you had these conversations with patients? <laughs> <laughs> Man, I, I just have like, I just talk about it really frankly and matter of fact, yeah. like I will not, t I will not use the word come. Like yeah. I won't say when you come in to give a semen analysis, mm. but, I, but I like acknowledge the humor because I'll notice a lot of the guys in the room will chuckle. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll just say, Hey man, like, why don't you present to the office and give a sample? <laughs> Um, so it's that kind of wordplay that, yeah. you know, we're always used to. Um, but, you know, to the question, how do I know someone's ovulating? There are ovulation prediction kits people use that measure the urine LH levels. And when those levels peak, you know, you're going to ovulate in about 48 hours. So you want to have sperm exposure. You want to have intercourse the day the kit is positive and the day yeah. after. So, for example, people do artificial insemination. And that's, a, you know, a large reason why I use the term sperm exposure, because People have, people will do insemination, artificial insemination with donor sperm, with partner sperm, whatever, husband sperm, whatever the scenario is. And they will time the insemination based on an ovulation prediction kit. So they know, hey, my kid is positive on Wednesday. That's great. Come on in um, and we'll do um, IUI on Thursday. Yeah. So, and then we're seeing all the apps. Everyone uses an app to monitor um, you know, cycles. They're not the best. There are a lot of pretenders out there, but there's, there's still some good ones. Nice. Um, so let's go. So let's see questions in here. Do you ovulate if you have a Mirena IUD and no period then? So you're, you could, so a Mirena IUD has a progestin, is secreting progestin locally, thinning out your lining, making your lining thin. That's why you don't have periods. Even if you do, you might ovulate while you're, while you have a marina in place, but you'll never shed because your lining is so thin. So there's really nothing to shed. Um, many times though, the progestin that gets in, that is secreted locally can get into the system and may be enough to prevent ovulation, but it doesn't always. Um, why can one still get periods even if on birth control? I'm going to come, I want to come back to some of these because I want to talk about these cases. Okay. Um, so let's talk about. Do you want to bring a student on to uh, pimp while you're doing some cases? I mean, <laughs> sure. It's up to you. If anyone wants to come on in, I don't know. How do we bring them in? Uh, I'll bring them in. They they okay, they know yeah, how to bring, raise their hand. You can and, bring you can bring like can you bring more than one in? I can bring four max in. Bring four in and let's see. 
I let's see. Do I? Yeah, let's let's bring four in. All right. We'll 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 riff this off the top. Um. Yeah, let's go. Thirty-two-year-old G zero with Q thirty-five to forty. Trying to conceive times four. Let's say trying to conceive for twelve months. What next? Uh, healthy. All right, who's there? Declare yourself. <laughs> We have Zara. Hi, my name's Zara. Nice to meet What's up, you. Zara? Nice to meet you. Where are you from? Uh, Columbus, Ohio. All right. Yeah. And we have so, Kiera. Kiera. Kiera, what's up? Yeah. Hello, hello. Where are you at? Richmond, Virginia. But Georgia right. was well, my hometown. Emory Georgia on the mine. Yeah. Georgia on the mine. That's right. <laughs> um, we have anybody else coming in? Uh, I picked four. We'll, we'll see if they make okay. it. Okay, so we got Kara and Z Zora? Zara. Zara, okay. All right, so I'll start with you, Zara, while we wait for other people. What, this 32-year-old G0, G0 means they've never been pregnant. Uh, Mona has joined, so Mona, jump in real quick. Where are you from? All right, throw it in the chat. Zara, what do you want to do? This patient has been trying to conceive for 12 months, um, has... 35 to 40 day cycle. So a little bit longer than mm -hmm. average. What, no, no healthy, not on any medications, just wants to get pregnant. What, what's the first thing you want to do? Um, take a history, find out if, you know, there's any family history with infertility, if they're on any. There isn't. Okay. What next? Um, You're okay. I'm going to, this is my style. So yeah. <laughs> just keep going. Um, if they're on any kind of birth controls, if there. She's not. She's not. She's not on any meds. She's been trying to conceive for the last 12 months. Um, and I don't expect you guys to like kill this. This is not stuff you guys talk about all the time in med school. If they so, had any kind of like problems, like maybe IUDs or not IUDs. Um, she, she was on birth control pills. So she was in high school at age 16. She was put on birth control pills because her cycles were a little bit irregular and she was starting to have, uh, become sexually active. So she was put on birth control pills and then she was on pills until just re uh, t until 12 months ago after she got married, she stopped the pill. So this is the common story. So the first thing to figure out is, is she ovulating? Zara, do you think she's ovulating? Is she ovulating? She yeah. has periods every 35 to 40 days. So is she on her period right now? She is uh, cycle day 20. Um, I'm guessing not on her period. Or She's not, not on her period. Right now. She's oh. not. Kira, is she ovulating? Yeah, she has periods. So She has periods. Ovulation occurs, yes. So she is ovulating. So we can tell her that she is ovulating. So what do you want to do? So what workup does she need? First of all, what is the definition of infertility, Kiara? Do you know? No, I do not. So infertility, does anybody she's, know? She's not, she's not able to get pregnant, like, like symbolic. Yeah, so you have to have 12 months of unprotected intercourse. If you're not pregnant after 12 months of, un of unprotected intercourse, that is considered infertility and that warrants a workup, regardless of how old you are. If you're 20 and you've been trying to conceive for 12 months, you should undergo an infertility workup. If you're over the age of 35 and you've been trying for six months or more, you should undergo an infertility workup. The reason is after 12 months of unprotected intercourse, 85% of patients should have conceived. After six months, 75% of couples should have conceived. So if you're over 35 and you've been trying for six months, you, you need to go, you need time. Time is not on your side. So you need to initiate workup and treatment first. And then 12 months is for everybody at under 35 and above. Now, obviously, if someone has a concern, if they have irregular periods, if for some reason they know their partner uh, doesn't make sperm, that's different. That's when you would initiate treatment sooner. Okay, who else do we have here? Is that is that you, Mona? Are you Mona and Daniel? Did I read that right? Yeah. All right, cool. Yes, I'm Mona, but I didn't really catch this from the beginning because like the internet was cutting off. 
So don't worry. I'm going to keep in for the, the middle of something that I was like, that's don't worry for the sake of time. I'm going to move. And then if there's a question that comes up, I'll ask you guys. Okay. I appreciate you guys staying on kind of out, you know, being the uh, brave ones here. So this, this patient needs a couple things. So if we go back to our picture, so we know 40% of couples who walk into the door will have an ovary problem. Specifically, they skip periods. They require medication to bring on a period. She has 35 to 40 day menses. She doesn't require medication to bring on a period. She doesn't skip periods. She's just a little bit longer. She has a longer follicular phase. So she might have some underlying ovulation dysfunction. The other issue that goes with the ovary is age. She's 32, she's young, but she's starting to feel it. Um, at the age of 30 is when your fertility probably starts its first dip. Um, and then it kind of plateaus. And then at about 37, the decline is becomes very steep. So this is based on epidemiologic data from the Hutterites. People talk about 35, but really the magic number is 37. That's when the decline is the steepest. So patients peak. And then when they hit 30, they kind of go shallow. And then when they hit 35, it starts to go like this as far as fertility goes. And then miscarriage starts to peak at 35 going up. Okay, miscarriage rate goes up that way. All right. So you start with the ovary, 40%, that's 40% of the problem. The next is the sperm. 50% of couples will have a male factor. If you remember anything from this lecture today, it's that uh, infertility is not just a ovary female problem. It is oftentimes a sperm problem. Um, and men today are more are less reluctant to get a semen analysis. So the workup here would be to get a semen analysis. Semen analysis is pretty simple. These are usually um, you know mas masturbatory samples abstained from ejaculation two to five days before giving the sample. And you look at volume, concentration, motility, and shape. I, I want to go back to men are less common nowadays, less reluctant to, to give a semen analysis, semen sample. So there was like when I started 10 years ago, yeah. you would have more partners that were just a little more reluctant to give a semen sample because they like, I don't want to go. So people are weird about their, first of all, I think we could, you know, masturbation habits, very, everyone has them there. They can be, you know, very uncomfortable doing, you know, masturbating in a place that's not your own private layer or whatever. Yeah. Um, so I think people just feel uncomfortable doing it in a hallway. Who's is someone going to walk in? Is someone <laughs> gonna hear, I'm going to hear people. Like there are all these phobias that people have yeah. and I get it. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, and I could talk for hours about, yeah. you know, a sperm collection room at a fertility clinic and the evolution I, of that. I've been in one. I'll, I'll call myself out. I've been in one. <laughs> It's yeah, very, I mean, very it's, interesting. Yeah, it used to be there was a lot of magazines and videos, and now everyone has their phone. There. <laughs> everyone just brings their phone, right? So there's a psychology, there's a so social experiment waiting to happen. Yeah. So, so um, it's important to look at the sperm, and that has to be a critical part of the workup. It's pretty easy to get. And then the last thing is looking at the tubes. So doing an HSG, which is a pelvic exam done under an x-ray machine, where you push dye into the uterine cavity, and then you push dye to see what the tubes, are they open or not. It also tells you about the uterine cavity. It's very crampy. The uterus is a potential space. So when you distend it with, um, with the uh, Conray dye that they use, it's very crampy. I tell the men in the room, I say, hey, they're not paying attention while I'm having this conversation. They might be on the phone. They might be doing something. I'll say, Hey, this is, you need to pay attention because this is very uncomfortable. This is like getting kicked in the genitals. That stomach ache men feel when they get kicked in the genitals is probably not that dissimilar from the menstrual cramping um, that women get, let alone the pain from the study. And when I tell them that they're like, Oh, really? And I'm like, yeah, that's why, you know, women are the stronger uh, species, <laughs> if, you, if you will. Um, so that is the workup. Questions or comments about that from the group down here? Um, I don't. Kira, <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, go yeah, ahead. yeah. Um, so the dye that you're talking about for to expand the tube is that similar to like um, CT contrast dye, or it's a different kind of? Uh, it's, a, it's a different. It's a little bit different. It's an I, yeah. It's a it's an iodine base. It's it's iodine base, okay. and it's like diluted in saline, one to one. So it's, 
know, people are like, I have a shellfish allergy. I have all this. Like, that's not, um, you don't need to worry too much about that. Cool beans. Thank you. So here we go. These are basically the three treatment options for this patient. And when it comes to fertility treatment, it's all about pace. So everyone's, everyone arrives at a different, everyone's, uh, arrives at the train station of the fertility journey differently to, to use a weird metaphor, but it's actually true. The physical, mental, financial issues that have plagued that person up to the point that they see me are all very different and their motivations are different. Their pace, their sense of urgency is all very different. So my job is to collect information about them and then help them decide what we, what, do we need to accelerate their pace? Do we need to decelerate their pace? Do we need to give them a more, a greater sense of urgency than they already have? So that testing that we do helps us determine that. Um, so Clomid IUI is kind of the first line treatment. You use Clomid for two reasons. One is to super ovulate somebody. So someone who doesn't ovulate, I'm sorry, someone who does ovulate, you use, clo you use Clomid to super ovulate them so they'll release more than one egg. Um, and then the other use is to help someone ovulate who doesn't ovulate. So in our patient, she does ovulate, so we're, but she's a little bit longer in her follicular phase. So we're gonna use the drug to actually try to super ovulate her and maybe even shorten that uh, follicular phase. The chances of success with this are about 10% with a five to 8% chance of twins and a cost of about $500 per cycle. So fertility treatment in the United States is not typically covered by insurance, although that is changing and we will see that change over the next um, decade. We will see it greater and greater. But I think what's important to call out, let me fix my lighting up in here, but I think what's important to call out is it's not the insurance company that dictates whether you have coverage, it's your employer. So people like to bag on the, they like to dunk on the insurance company. Ah, the insurance company doesn't cover this or that. You got to actually talk to your employer because it's your employer who has decided to buy a benefits package that includes or doesn't include uh, for fringe benefits like fertility treatment because your employer has decided the people that work there probably don't need it. So they would think otherwise if the employees told them that, hey, yeah, we do need this. This is important. So Basically, the treatment strategy is you do Clomid IUI for three cycles. This is like entry-level fertility treatment. And IUI is also artificial insemination. And with artificial insemination, basically what you're doing is you're putting sperm directly into the genital tract. When you have intercourse, you're depositing millions of sperm in the vagina. Thousands make it up through the cervix. And then only hundreds make it up into the tube. When you do artificial insemination, you're depositing millions of sperm directly into the uterine cavity and then millions are sitting there waiting for the egg to be released. So this gives the treatment, uh, gives the patient a boost. So if our patient, the 32 year old was trying for 12 months, her likelihood of pregnancy per month at that point is five to 10, is, is less than 5%. By giving her clomiphene and artificial, uh, or I'm sorry, and uh, IUI, we're giving her a two to three times boost in her chances of success. If that doesn't work after three cycles, the strategy is to move to IVF, um, where this patient will have about a 50 to 70% chance of success with one cycle, but this will come at a cost of about $18,000. The twin rate is less than 4% because we transfer one embryo with IVF. In IVF, what you're doing now is you're creating the embryo um, and then outside the body and then transferring it back into the uterus. Um, so we'll talk about IVF in a second. Questions or comments here? Yeah, um, you're talking about the woman and um, her chances. Um, but I think also, like, to just take into account maybe, like, the man, if the, if the male partner has any issues with infertility as well, which could be the reason why she's having issues on conceiving. Absolutely. And that's why that semen analysis is so important, because if that semen analysis shows a total modal sperm count of less than 5 million, and a total modal sperm count is the volume of the ejaculate times the concentration times the uh, total, the percent total modal, if that number is less than five, then they need to move to IVF with ICSI. 
because their ability to spontaneously conceive is going to be low. Okay. So let's talk about IVF. So IVF is in vitro fertilization, and it's been around for about 40 years. In its current iteration, it's only been around for about 25, 30. But basically what happens with IVF is, remember normally, IVF is amplification and manipulation of a normal menstrual cycle, okay? So normally what happens, remember you have FSH that comes from the brain that recruits dominant follicles here in the ovary, and normally one follicle is recruited and released. With IVF, you give patients exogenous hormones of FSH um, that will cause all of the eggs that are available for recruitment to grow. So you're super ovulating these patients, and then at some point, you will retrieve all the eggs through an outpatient surgical procedure called an egg retrieval, And then you will take the eggs that you get, and then you will inseminate those eggs one of two ways, either conventionally by just dropping 100,000 sperm around the egg and letting the sperm penetrate the egg, or through a process called ICSI, which to the point earlier was if the sperm counts are super low and there's not much sperm to work with, you can take one single sperm and inject it into an egg. Okay? Um, so... These are called insemination strategies. So you can do conventional in vitro fertilization, or you could do ICSI, again, intracytoplasmic sperm injection. And then you grow the resulting embryo. The next day you find out you have a pre-embryo called a zygote. And then, I'm gonna, and then you culture that embryo for three days, at which point it becomes the cleavage stage embryo. Funny story. And ch sharing with patients this very picture, I do this every day, probably 10 times a day. I said, hey, this is what a cleavage embryo looks like. Let me pull it. They're like, yeah, what does an embryo that's at the cleavage stage look like? So I Googled cleavage and then hit enter without typing embryo. And then I turned the screen and wasn't paying attention. And basically a Google image search of cleavage um, basically showed up and the patient just started laughing and I didn't actually realize what was going on because I had turned the screen away. I was in autopilot and then I was like, Oh my God, I'm so embarrassed. Um, so anyway, day three embryos, cleavage stage embryos, uh, funny story from the trenches. So the, the embryo grows, grows out to the fifth day on which the fifth day you have what becomes a blastocyst. And the blastocyst is the stage of the embryo that has made it into the endometrium. Okay, a cleavage stage embryo is still in the tube. It's still in the tube here. And then remember, it transits down and implants. And by the time it implants, it becomes a day five embryo. So this is how IVF works. Okay, and this process takes about three weeks. And it's a pretty intense physical, financial, and emotional process. And that's why it's important. The patient experience is very important for fertility clinics. And that's going to be very important for the, you have to support patients. There is no more specialty in medicine that has to, in which the providers and the team have to present empathy, have to understand empathy. You've got to walk a mile in these people's shoes um, to take, I mean, you should do that in any specialty you go into. But if you just take a minute to walk a mile in your patient's shoes in this, in this specialty, it will go such a long way because think about it. You're going to about, you're, you're about to, these patients are going to invest significantly emotionally, physically, and financially into you and your team. And you have, to, I believe you have to give a little bit of yourself to everybody, um, which maybe on the wellness tip is not the best idea, but um, I think if you want to provide the best care for these patients, it's the way to go. We, um, we've had some some uh, infertility specialists in the past who have taken that a little too literal. <laughs> Is that too, too much? <laughs> yeah, no, no, I know. Yeah, like you don't want to give too much. <laughs> Um, yes. I, mean, it, I think what you're referring to is the uh, unfortunate uh, practice of a prior generation or two of giving their own sperm 
to yeah. uh, patients unknowingly. Yes. Not recognize, thinking they were doing the patient a favor, but in reality, <laughs> you cannot be out here doing things to people without transparency. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, it's a shame. Our field, unfortunately, gets these black marks because of this kind of behavior. Yeah. Um, so, but that's an important thing to call out. And that's not something, and we got to call that out and not run from it. Yeah. Ho- hopefully with, with the, the prevalence of genetic testing nowadays, hopefully people will be, um, they, they, they should not they do it be anyway. Mindful. They'll yeah. be more mindful and go, ah, I don't want to be the person who's like, Hey, 30, 30 offspring related to this one doctor because of 23 and me. Yeah. You cannot, you just can't do that. Yeah. Um, and, and that's the thing. Uh, re- reproductive endocrinologists tend to be some of the most anally, anal retentive uh, personalities because the attention to detail is so significant, right? You have to have whose embryo is this, the chain of command. Reproductive endocrinology and infertility clinics are like little hospitals in the, of themselves. They have yeah. their own lab. They run their own assays. They have their own ultrasound and radiology units. They have their own... Um, um, surgery suites. They are ambulatory practice with some inpatient surgery, like with some surgery. So it's complicated. Yeah. Um, I want to, I want to end on this last point, which is taking this embryo and now biopsying it. So you can biopsy these embryos. Now we've been doing this for several decades, but now it's mainstream pre-implantation genetic testing is an add on to IVF. So there are different types of genetic testing. There are um, aneuplo- testing for aneuploidy, testing for structural rearrangements, and of course structural, for, uh, and of course doing single gene uh, mutation testing. So there's all sorts of stuff. Uh, this field, if you want to be on the frontier of science, if you want to have a field where there's never a dull moment, if you want to be in a field where you're making a difference in people's lives, and then you're actually doing a public service by educating people about how menses works. Um, we didn't even get into it. I mean, you know, we have a couple minutes and I want to go to the questions, but I mean, again, I spend most of my time, I'm, a, I'm the medical director of the unit at WashU. I'm the associate program director of the fellowship. I teach the second year course. Um, the goal, you know, we talk about fertility preservation for cancer patients. We talk about fertility preservation for gender affirming Uh, care. We talk about um, sperm banking. We talk about infertility. We talk about egg freezing for people who want to preserve their fertility. I mean, it's never a dull moment, let alone all the ethical debates um, that go with genetic testing. So with that, I want to go to as many questions as we can. Yeah. Do you want to say anything? Is there anything before I just jump into these? No, go ahead. I was I was looking for some key questions. I think the the PGD one was good. Um, that that's why we were going through some IVF potentially. We we ended up rolling the dice, but uh, we our our first daughter, our our first child, um, is an SMA kiddo, and and so mm. we were going to do PGD to to make sure that the second kiddo didn't have SMA. But we rolled the dice, and he's a carrier. So gotcha. Yeah. So that's so <clears throat> again, walk a mile in your patient's shoes. Um, there, like you will see patients who have a child, um, and they want to make sure their next child doesn't have that disease. You will see patients who have Huntington's disease, who know they have, they're a carrier, who know that at age 60, they will die of significant neurodegenerative failure. Um, and they want to make sure they can at least have the opportunity to experience parenthood without the fear of their child, um, you know, having to carry on that legacy, if you will. Um, of that disease. Yeah. I also have patients who have had four children and they're all men and they're all boys and they want to have a girl. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. where do you draw the line? You know, I think we, we would all probably feel comfortable with sex determination if someone had a sex linked disease. Mm. But on the on other end of the spectrum is the person who has no infertility, who wants to create embryos of one sex and then discard the others and we'll do multiple cycles of IVF just to have, you know, a male embryo. Um, and most, mo- you know, American Society of Reproductive Medicine does not condone that. Um, they don't endorse that. There is an ethics statement if you want to check it out on ASRM about that. 
but the genetics issue is big and there's all there's you know in the future you're going to be able to go not too long and not too distant you'll be able to go to the clinic hacking darwin um you can read that book jamie metzel um former mayoral candidate for from kansas city i think i saw someone from kansas city um interest you know um the idea is that you could go to a clinic and you could have a printout of these emb- these are the embryos you've created uh this embryo a has a greater propensity of this physical characteristic or that versus embryo b which has a less propensity for these diseases but doesn't have the same physical characteristics and then you can basically choose the future of sex is here it's not what it what it was growing up and life moves forward things change language changes we change and we have to decide what how we're going to participate in it or if we're just going to resist it how was fellowship for me it was great it was three years it's 18 months of research it's 18 months of clinic uh, what is next gen sequencing next gen sequencing is used in pre-implantation genetic testing um, or SNP arrays. Um, can you determine any copper number changes with, yes, you can. Um, ge- can we do genetic modification? So the group in Oregon and the group at Columbia. So Eric Foreman at Columbia, um, their group is participating in some early studies looking at CRISPR. So I would Google Eric Foreman and the science, uh, Dieter, uh, D- Dieter, I think is his first name or last name. I can't remember. Um, what is super fecundation? That's where like you release multiple eggs. Um, you're like really fecund is the likelihood of getting pregnant per month. A lot of female medical students freeze their eggs. Yes, they do. Um, the, now egg freezing is not a panacea. Let me just make, you know, egg freezing is not for everybody. Do you need to do egg freezing? I think it's important to have a conversation. It's important to have control over your reproductive future. Definitely go talk to somebody about it. But if you're 28, do you need to freeze your eggs if you have, you know, no, you don't have to. You might ultimately be in a situation. But the nice thing is you now have the power to make the decision yourself. Um, The sweet spot for egg freezing is probably 33 to 36. Um, But the earlier you do it, the more quantity and the more quality you have. Um, Are there still moral morality debates about picking your child's gender? Um, You know, we talk about this a lot. I'm very liberal when it comes to autonomy and choice when it comes to sex. And, and, you know, I'm very picky about this. Embryos, you know, they're either XX or XY. Embryo technically doesn't have a gender, but we use the terms interchangeably here. Um, are there still morality debates about it? Yes, I have partners who are very uncomfortable with sex determination or anything that uh, hints of it. Um, and when you work in a group practice, you have to respect your partners and um, you have to come to solutions. And that can be difficult because everyone feels passionate about their position. Um, Talk about that for one second, because I think it's an yeah. interesting dynamic of uh, if some partners are not necessarily against it, but are uncomfortable with it, and some partners are comfortable with it, is there a broad rule for the whole department? Or if a patient sees a physician who's uncomfortable, they send them to you? Every fertility <laughs> clinic has had this debate 400 times. Yeah. Um, I'm not kidding. Um, I think we, have, we, we, were, we were having it probably five times a year, and it was always the same arguments um, and the same positions. But basically, you have to. We decided to come up with a policy that we all could live with, and that policy is basically, we don't do sex selection. So if patient calls and schedules an appointment and says, "Hey, do you guys do sex selection?" We'll say, "No." End of story. However, if patients do genetic testing of their embryos for whatever reason, and we we will report out XX or XY, mm. and then if the embryos are equivalent in their quality, we will give them the option to choose. A loophole. <laughs> a loophole. There you go. Um, so okay. it's kind of, a, it, it, it's kind of, and I know we're up on time. I'm happy to just keep going through some of these questions and people can watch it later if that's permissible. Um, does that sound like a good idea? Do we want to do that? Yeah, we can hang for a couple more minutes. Okay, uh, I'll go rapid fire. Um, let's see, where did I start? What do you think of the removal of the 14th day rule with regards to embryo research? Let me tell you something. I think it's inevitable that we're going to keep going. I mean, they're growing the sheep in the embryo in the womb, in the plastic thing. I mean, we know where this is going. I think we need to be smart about it. And I think we need to be prepared, um, about it. 
I think it's inevitable. Um, it wasn't 20 years ago that we couldn't grow embryos past three days very well. And now the standard is to grow them out to the fifth day. So um, I don't think you can't, you have to put the embryos in after five days because that's when they're in sync with the endometrium. So you can't put them in later. Um, but this, 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 this is allowing us to better understand implantation, something we still don't understand very well. Um, is there any, any policy being done around the ethics in reproductive medicine? The American Society of Reproductive Medicine is kind of the uh, lead society that provides ethics opinions. Um, but they're not legally binding. I mean, certain states will have certain policies. I live in Missouri where there is no state statute about anything related to reproduction. Uh, for example, the birth mother is the mother, whereas in, across the river in Illinois, the genetic parent is the parent. So um, generally, uh, interestingly, a lot of red states don't have statutes defining these kind of things because they can't agree to, I mean, pass anything um, or they just, it's not a priority because it's reproduction. So no one bothers because they know it's not gonna go anywhere. Um, whereas blue states might be, there might be a path to such legislation or statutes being passed. What is the endometriosis effect on infertility? On fertility? I mean, it's, and endometriosis is associated with infertility and it's largely because endometriosis is an inflammatory state that can distort the tubal anatomy and that's how it can wreak havoc it, it, on the pelvis. Best advice for someone who may want to follow in your shoes, um, work hard, keep it real, and love what you do. I, I love, I, I did for fun, just because I love data, I did one of the continuous glucose monitors. I think that's the best thing in the world. My, my dad was a type 1 diabetic. And just yeah. the the change in lifestyle of just having a thing constantly knowing what your sugar is is amazing. It's so easy, and and I I mean honestly, it's less of a burden on me. Like for my patients who are type one diabetics, we don't have to play this song and dance about insulin control. They're controlled. They got the pump. We just say for our anesthesia colleagues, we just say, hey, this is what you need. this is what you adjust. Yep. Um, I'll go through a couple more, and then we'll shut it down. As an REI specialist, you get extra training in genetics. Um, it's not formal, but there are two programs right now um, at Hopkins and Wayne State that do REI genetics fellowships. So it's an extra year. The REI fellowship is three years. Remember, OBGYN is four years. We didn't even say this. REI fellowship is three years. Um, and again, 18 months of research, 18 months of clinical. Um, and then there's at, there are two programs that are doing a genetics fellowship, and that is, stands to grow. So I have a heavy philosophy background where could we find current bioethics debates, political influencers on IVF and fertility clinics. Um, there, I would start by looking at the American Society of Reproductive Medicine. So Google ASRM ethics committee opinions and just read those. Hmm. Um, can you discuss how endometriosis, we talked about that. Is it true that your temperature changes when you are ovulating? Yes. So when you ovulate, your hypothalamus resets to a higher temperature by one degree, and that's because of progesterone. Progesterone causes the core temperature to go up. So you go from 97 point, or 98 to 99, and that's where you see that traditional temperature spike. Now the temperature spike means you ovulated. It is not a tool to be like, oh cool, I spiked today, it's Wednesday, let's have sex today so we can maximize your, my chances of pregnancy. Because if you spike on Wednesday, temp spike on Wednesday, that means you probably ovulated on, on Saturday or Sunday and the window is probably closed. Um, I have, let's see, do you have it? So if you wanna have this conversation more, you can hit me up on Instagram at Dr. Kenan Omertag, MD, Dr. Kenan Omertag, MD. I have lots of content there. All the videos or all the whiteboard drawings I have, there's a lot more there if you wanna read it. That's the same content I deliver to the medical students at WashU in their first, second, and third years. So on my Instagram TV tab, all the whiteboard videos, how IVF works, how periods work. I mean, it's endless, the amount of content there. So if you have any questions, check that out. Um, I'm gonna go through this one more time. Yeah, do you rec I'll do this one last question because this is important. Do you re recommend genetic testing prior to IVF and IUI? I do. Um, we do expanded carrier screening with 274 panels looking for anybody who's trying to conceive, we sell them. 
you know, why don't you do this panel? It's two hundred dollars max out of pocket if your insurance doesn't cover it, and let's go. Um, that way, you know, if they come up with a mutation, and I test both people at the same time. You know, the academic paradigm is test one person, then wait, and then test the other person. I'm not here for that. I don't have time or patience, so I test both people at the same time because then we get the results and then we can answer the questions. Um, awesome. Stop there. Let's stop there. Ken, and thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Your enthusiasm. Yeah, right. Some Someone was like, can we have you on again? <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, I'll do this all the time. Uh, we can break it out into different topics, too, if people want to talk about I coverage and IVF. I mean, I have other places for that, but um, I, I did a little pod on uh, IVF coverage and the history of it in this country. Fertility awesome. Insider podcast, 17 Minutes. But I would love to do this again, Ryan. If there's a if there's an opportunity to let me know.